Good morning. It is Sunday, July 12th, and the second Sunday since we've been able to resume Sunday morning worship services here at Stetchford Baptist Church in Victoria Road, Stetchford, Birmingham. Welcome to you today, whether you are uh, viewing online or sitting there in the church, enjoying today's service. I'd like to say to those particularly this morning who are sitting in the service at uh, Stetford Baptist Church in Victoria Road, that uh, on your seat you will have found a consent form for the test and trace program operated through the NHS. And please, uh, if you would, wouldn't mind uh, completing that so that we can, with good conscience, uh, give permission to NHS just in case someone needs to reach you so to make sure that you're okay. So this is just an extra measure that we're uh, volunteering, volunteering to take part in. And likewise, with all of the measures that we've instituted, it's all with a view to safety and health of everyone who comes first and foremost. We all long for the day and when we won't have to do any of this stuff. But until that time, we, have, we exercise patience and we, we look to the Lord for uh, life to become a little bit more normal. But in the meantime, you know, God is at work and he's maybe at work in your heart during these days. It's really uh, caused us to consider what's really important. I'll also mention that there is a, a tin up at the front as you leave uh, by the piano. If you do bring a cash donation that you're able to just pop it in there, we're not going to have a regular type of offering. And for anyone uh, viewing online, please be sure to visit our website, stetchfordbaptist.org.uk. And if you can make contact with us, we can provide you with details as to how you can give towards the needs of this church. This morning, we are, are delighted to be able to spend time together in worship. We, we love enjoying music together here at, at the church. And so Karen and I are going to bring uh, several songs that we hope will be a blessing to your heart as you worship the Lord in your hearts. We also really appreciate being able to join our hearts together in prayer and praying for the needs of our church through Mary Bliss, who is um, really adept at bringing those prayers together for us so that we may call out to the Lord at a time such as this. And this morning we, we look forward as well to the final, perhaps the final time that we're going to hear from uh, Pastor Jeff Lee for a while in God's Word as he shares from the book of Proverbs once again, the words of wisdom, walking in wisdom. So God bless us all, everyone, as we look to him and uh, bring our needs to him. May God really bless each one of us for having spent the time here together. Amen. <music> Faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you. Waiting here for you. Still you know my heart, the author of salvation, you've loved us from the start. Waiting here for you, with our hands lifted high. Faithful 
Hello and good morning. Our prayers for Sunday the 12th of July. And scripture to carry us into our prayer, the words of our Lord, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what is lost. And the psalmist writes, come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God, in your Son, Jesus Christ, you have triumphed over darkness and death and opened to us the way to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Saviour, you have given us new hope and new joy. As we rejoice in his presence, may we give glory to you. Blessed are you, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. We give thanks for Jesus, the Good Shepherd, and we pray for all who are called to share in his ministry as shepherds and guides of your flock. We pray for all church leaders, for preachers of the word and all who minister in your church. We ask your blessing upon all who are involved in pastoral care and those who seek out the lost and the straying. We pray for churches that are opening the week, this week for private prayer and for those now holding restricted worship on Sundays. Lord, we ask your blessings upon all who may come through the doors of our churches, whether a church member or someone coming for the first time. May all meet with you in your house and be blessed. Holy God, hear us and help us through Jesus Christ, our Shepherd. Lord, guide and strengthen the leaders of the world. We pray for all who seek to bring peace. We pray for all who are striving for justice and the relief of poverty. We pray for countries torn apart by war, for all who are persecuted for their faith, for all the innocent and the children, for all who suffer. We pray for our world living under the threat of the pandemic. Father, God, we plead for a way forward to help solve the problem of COVID-19. Holy God, hear us and help us through Jesus Christ, our Shepherd. Lord, bless our homes and our loved ones. May we show respect and care for all around us and not be caught up with selfishness and greed. Help us, through our love for each other, to reveal your love in the world. Loving God, we pray for all who express your love in the way they care for others, giving thanks for all that is done locally by caring for those in need. Remembering the members of the church who devote their time in helping and caring for others. We pray for homes where there is little sense of love or where there is neglect or abuse. We pray for all who feel at the mercy of circumstance and those who are unable to manage on their own. Holy God, hear us and help us through Jesus Christ, our Shepherd. Lord, we bring to you in prayer those known to us who are ill or in need and those who have asked for our prayers. We pray for Eunice and all who are supporting her through this difficult time. For Nina, baby Eric, Chris, for Harold and his wife, Sean, Bernadette and Colin, Harry, for Chris, Carol and Jack, for Carter and her family, and for Marlene. Give to them your healing and restore them in body, mind and spirit. Give courage and hope to all who seek your healing and your peace. We pray for anyone who may have joined us for the first time today, hoping that you will be blessed through our prayer and by our teaching. In a short time of silent prayer, I invite you to pray for yourself or to name anyone or anything that you would like us to pray for. So now in a short silence, 
Let us pray for people and needs, not only to ourselves, praying for God's healing and for his grace. And the words of the psalmist, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. We join together now in saying the Lord's Prayer, using whichever translation or language you prefer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And our closing prayer. O oh God, be a tower of strength to all who trust in you. Empower us by your Spirit. Lead us that we may lead others. Guide us that we may be the people you would have us be. And direct us that we may do what you would have us do. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Shepherd. Amen. And our blessing. The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen and establish you. To him be power and glory forever. Amen. If you've joined us for the first time today and you'd like to talk with one of us about the Christian faith, or if you have any questions about scripture or prayer that we may be able to help you with, then please do get in contact with us at Stetchford Baptist Church. And the online address that you can contact us on is stetchfordbaptist.org.uk and we'll be in touch with you. So thank you. On this thirsty desert ground in a dry and barren land I bow down I need you now You are calling, I will come To your river I will run, I bow down I need
Just like the desert needs the blessing of the rain Just like the winter waiting for the sun again I need you now Just like a river as it reaches for the sea Just like a song it needs the sound of melody I need you now Just like the desert needs the blessing of the rain Just like the winds are waiting for the sun again I need you now Just like a river as it reaches for the sea Just like a song it needs the sound of melody Expectations. Life is full of expectations, isn't it? Just an example, when you start a new job, like I did many years ago, I was working, went to work in a factory for a little while, in a chocolate factory. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? And as I started in that job, there were so many things that I had to learn, that I had to understand, and it took time. I, I couldn't just jump in and just do the job like those who had been there for a long time. No, there was an expectation of learning, an expectation of, of putting all these things together and, and being able to do the job well, but it took time, it took training, it took spending time with other people to learn. There was a, a huge learning curve. And many of you, I'm sure you, you've either started in a new school and there's been a learning curve, there's been expectations for you to follow, some that are um, written and some that are unwritten. There are, when we start a new job, there are expectations and there's a learning curve. Life is, is full of expectations. And uh, why is it so hard though for us to sometimes adjust to the expectations and the changes that are around us? Have you ever thought about that? Why, why is it so hard for us to adjust to new expectations and, and that are placed in front of us. Maybe it's a, again, adjusting to a new school, a new environment such as work, new neighborhood, all these kind of things sometimes are very difficult to adjust. Have you ever considered that God has expectations for us to adjust to? That may be a new concept for some of us and it may be just a reminder again of, of that concept of that, that God does have expectations for us. And yes, we're saved by grace, but God does have a way and a plan for us to live. We're going to learn how to act wisely before God this morning. We're going to learn how to act in obedience to Him, with to His expectations, and to the wisdom that leads to, in this passage, tells us there are some blessings, there are some rewards for following God's expectations. But why is it so difficult? Why is it difficult for us to do 
these things? Why is it difficult for us to even follow God's expectations? It is a challenge, isn't it? Maybe you have, a, if you have a moment, just pull out uh, your driver's license, okay? So here's my driver's license. It's my UK one, all right? Uh, maybe you've got one from a different country if you're watching elsewhere or, um, or you, you're in the UK and you, you have a different uh, European state that yours is. Um, I've got a, a, a British one. I've got a, an Ontario one as well. But uh, that, that driving license comes with some expectations, doesn't it? If you if you got a parent uh, and you're watching this, uh, go go ask them to see their driver's license, okay? Yeah, so so take that moment, take a look at your driver's license, and and as we look at it, we we know that it, it's taken some time to get this. If if you've had to earn it yourself, or if you got a parent or a family member that you're looking at their license, it it takes a lot a lot of time to to learn how to get to a point where you can be uh, able to get a license and a driver's license. I know when I was 16, before I was 16, I, I couldn't wait to get my driver's license. And and there's that whole process of learning and taking uh, some some driver lessons and, and that really, really took some time. But there's expectations that come with having a driver's license and, and the government places down uh, some rules and regulations for us to follow. There, there are expectations. Like, for instance, when I drive, I need to drive safely on the road. I need to uh, watch the speed limit to make sure that the speed I'm doing is keeping with what the rules are. Uh, when I uh, am driving around a roundabout or through an intersection, I, I need to be careful and watch all ways because uh, the expectation is if I don't, I could very much put myself in danger and others in danger. So there are expectations all around us, even including uh, just having a simple driver's license, even getting that license, there are expectations that come along with that. It doesn't just happen, does it? I, I don't just get into a car and just drive and get my license. No, it, it takes time. There's a process involved. And it's the same thing with God. With, with God and, and our relationship with, with him. And the pro writer of Proverbs wants to tell us that, you know, living in wisdom takes some work. Take, living it with wisdom takes a, a mindset that, that it, it needs to change. And there's some learning involved. And as we grow in wisdom, we want to focus in on how to act wisely before God. And, and there's these expectations to follow that we must learn that, that takes some time. And, and so hopefully for us, we can take some time to learn these expectations and how to, and what what God has for us, and how to 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 step into those, and also um, how how we can live those out in our lives. But also, as I said before, that there's some rewards that come with this. So we're just going to look this morning at Proverbs chapter three. So the first expectation that we see that the the writer of Proverbs gives to us is to trust in the Lord, to trust. What's it? What does it mean to trust? I mean, we use trust every day, don't we? We we trust when we drive in a vehicle that the vehicle is going to run. We we trust that when we're driving and we're in a br going over a bridge that's going to hold us up. We we trust that the food that we buy from a grocery store is going to be healthy and not contaminated and uh, not make us sick. Or when we buy it from a restaurant, the, these things are poor. We we but. A lot of our life is involved in trust. We trust people. We trust uh, things. And the writer of the, the Proverbs wants us to trust in God, to put our trust in him, to rely on him. And this trust is not just something that's just, oh yeah, you know, trust that, you know, I take a spoon of ice cream and I put it into my mouth and uh, trust that it's going to be good. No, this is a this is a a, 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 a kind of trust that that is Im, implicitly uh, focused in relying on God in this life for our life, for uh, our training, for our understanding, for uh, His will and direction and guidance and help. 
all through this life. So th this this trust is not just a, a, a basic trust. It's a it's a great trust that involves all of our life. And and the writer goes on, he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, implying again that this is not just uh, one part of our life, but all of who we are. It kind of reminds us of that passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, where uh, the writer says this, that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength. It's really important, isn't it? Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, didn't he? Re-emphasizing re that. And, and so the, the writer is saying, trust in the Lord. Love the Lord with all your heart. Trust in him in this life. Trust his will. Trust what he says and what how he guides us is the right way, is the truth, is set for us to help us and to guide us not to to put us down not to 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 make us sick or unwell or those kind of but that the these kind of things god sets up are 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 good things and when we follow these good things they help us they they god it's like a a protection around us like a parent who sets up a fence in their back garden to protect their children so that they won't be able to run out to a busy street or get into somebody else's property and get into something that's dangerous that that could uh, hurt them that we that that fence is there for a good purpose for a good reason it's for protection and god's laws god's commands god's purposes are set there for our good and so we are to trust god with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength with our heart. And then he goes on to say this, that, uh, and do not lean on your own understanding. Wow, that's that's powerful for me. See, a lot of life decisions are our are, are marriage, our relationships, our jobs. A lot of the decisions that we make in this life uh, God wants us to trust him in all those decisions. He wants us to follow his ways in all those decisions and not just go on our own, try to do things in our own strength with our own wisdom and oftentimes in worldly wisdom because, you know what, we grow up in a culture that tells us how to live these things, how to do these things, and, and sometimes they're not right, they're not correct, they're not helpful. They lead down a path to hurt because it's based on worldly wisdom. Oftentimes, there within worldly wisdom, there's sin involved in some of those assumptions, and so we need to be careful uh, that we do not lean on our own understanding and try to make decisions on our own. Then the the, the writer goes on in verse six. He says, "In all your ways, acknowledge Him." That that idea of knowledge there means. Um, being aware of or thinking of of knowing God. So in all your ways, acknowledge him, know him, be aware of him in all these decisions, in all of life. So when you get up in the morning, reminding yourself of him, being aware of God's presence in your life. As you go through the day, as you eat, as you interact with people, as you go to work, as you do your work, to be aware of God. Be aware of what God wants us to do in these situations. How do we know? Well, God has given us a lot of direction and a lot of guidance in his word on how to, how to work, how to treat other people in relationships. And so these things are very important. They take time. It takes learning, just like learning how to drive and getting that driver's license, right, takes time. And so we're to acknowledge him. And this is the promise. It's not just that when we acknowledge him, it, you know, nothing happens. But the writer says this, and he will make your paths straight. Wow. God will make your path straight. So does this mean that God's going to pave a, a, an actual physical road for us to walk straight on? No, this is, uh, he's talking to, in, in the sense of the moral implication here of living a life that's pleasing to God, of 
you know, the right and wrong in our life, doing the right thing. And so when we acknowledge God, when we trust Him, when we uh, live for Him in our lives, the, the implication here is that God fills us with His moral correctness, His ways. And so we will walk in straight ways with Him. And he will direct our paths. He will make our path straight. And that's, that's that moral path. And do what's right. Very important. Let's go on to verses 7 and 8. Where it says that we're to learn a proper um, fear of, of God. Proper fear of God. It says this. Be not wise in your own eyes. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away. Or as the NIV uses the word shun evil. Turn away from it. Run from evil. The idea here of fearing God is this sense of humility. Of coming under God and realizing who he is. That he is perfect. That he is holy. That he is set apart from us. He is he is morally right in all his decisions and his ju judgments and, and his plans and his will are perfect. And his standard of living is, is way higher than any one of us could ever imagine. And we could never reach it. And putting God in and understanding his place, that he's the power to give, our, give us life and take it away, that's his. He has the authority. And he has the authority to allow us to go to heaven and that authority to send us to eternal life in hell. God has great authority over our life, whether we like to hear that or not. It's the truth. And so we need to put God into a proper perspective in our life, to fear him. But what that means is understanding that we have some fears in life. But as we fear God, it helps to push away the other fears. I like to think of it this way is the more I fear God and realize who he is and what, what he can do and what he's done and what he's going to do, it helps me not to fear what other people think of me in my faith and how I live my faith and, and what I do for the Lord. So when I share the gospel with people, sometimes people don't like to hear the good news about what Jesus has done for them. And sometimes they're offended. But and sometimes they might not talk to me and they might want to, to be a part of, of my life. And sometimes that can be hurtful. But you know what? I'm not afraid to share my faith because I fear God more than I fear people. So proper fear of God helps put other things in our lives into perspective. I don't fear other people because I know God is in control. I know he, he is in control of all things. And so if he allows someone to hurt me or persecute me or a group, that, that's fine because that's in God's hands. And I can trust him. I can trust him. So the, the scripture here says, be not wise in your own eyes. How often times in my own life I've tried to be wise in my own life. I've tried to do my own thing. I've tried to make my own plans. And oftentimes I've failed. Failed miserably. Maybe you're the same. Maybe you've, you've been in the same situations where you've tried to do things on your own. And you've tried to be wise in your own eyes. You thought, well, I, I don't care about what my parents have said or uh, what my pastor says or what the Bible says. I'm just going to do this thing anyway. And then you find out later, hey, I should have listened to that wisdom. I shouldn't have tried to do things in my own eyes. It's interesting. It reminds me of that story in the Old Testament of King Rehoboam, who's actually the son of Solomon, who didn't really follow fully in the ways that Solomon here writes his father. And, and Rehoboam decided when he became king that he didn't like what the advisors, who were advisors to his father, one of the wisest men who's ever lived, he didn't like what they were saying. And so he fired them all and he brought in his own council of friends and and that then these were men who were not wise. And he followed their wisdom and it and it ended up that the kingdom of Israel was split into two because of uh the way he acted, because he didn't follow uh his father's advisor's uh wisdom. And and so many times in our own life we, this is what happens is we follow our own ways. We think 
what we think is right and good. But the Bible is very clear that we are to follow in godly wisdom. And we are to search out godly wisdom. We are to seek godly wisdom. And here we are asked to not be wise in our own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away. Turn away from evil. See, sin and evil affects uh, every part of our life. Not fully, but it affects every part of our life. Our thinking, sometimes our speech, sometimes our actions. Sin affects us in many different ways. And it comes out at different times. Uh, but the fact is, we're not, it doesn't affect us 100% if that makes sense. So we are affected, we're tainted by sin, oftentimes, but we're not tainted 100%, if that makes sense, that we still carry the image of God, we still carry um, that conscience God has given us to make some morally right and good decisions. This is why people who are not Christians can make good decisions, because they have God's conscience on their heart. So they may not steal, or they may not generally lie, or they may not cheat and those kind of things, um, because their conscience tells them that these things are wrong, and that conscience has been given to us by God. But uh, we're to avoid evil, we're to run from it. It reminds me of the New Testament, where we're told by James to, to flee uh, the devil, uh, to resist him, and he will flee from you. That evil is, is crouching at the door, and is waiting to basically pounce on us, all the time. And we need to flee from these things. And here the writer is saying the same thing. To turn away from evil. Turn away. This idea of turning is kind of like that idea of repentance. When we just say, you know what, this is wrong. This is the wrong way of living, a wrong way of thinking, the wrong way of speaking, the wrong way of acting. And we decide, you know what, I'm going to turn away from that and I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to think right. I'm going to choose to speak right. I'm going to choose to walk right in the ways of God. So we're to turn from evil, to shun evil. Verse 8, it will bring healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. So here we, you've got, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. So there's this promise, this kind of sense of a, a, a promise that God will uh, direct your paths. And here, there's another uh, sense of, a, a, of, of a, a general kind of blessing that comes from being obedient and following God, is that he will heal your flesh and uh, refresh, bring freshment, refreshment to your bones. Well, what is he talking about here? Well, the fact is, we know from experience that stress, that fear, that hatred, anger, um, dissension, and, and difficulties in relationships bring stress, doesn't it? It brings a lot of stress into our life. Um, sometimes unwanted stress. And, and the hurt of these things can cause anxiety and can cause a lot of pain. And, and studies have shown time and again the effects of stress that stress has on the body is, is tremendous and, and can make people ill. People can have panic attacks. People can get ill. People can get cancer because their body is functioning, uh, their, because their mind and their, 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 their situations uh, are causing a lot of stress, anxiety, maybe even depression. And these things all have an effect on our body. And so when we follow the Lord and we trust Him and we do what's right, when we choose to deal with things in godly ways, it helps our body. It does bring healing. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where things are very difficult with between you and a colleague at work, or maybe you with and and a and a relationship you have, maybe with a child or uh, a marital relationship or um, someone at church, and and things are difficult, and there, there becomes a lot of stress, and sometimes bitterness can come up and and start to eat away at us. But when there's reconciliation. When we forgive one another and we love one another and we say, you know what, what you did to hurt me and what I did to hurt you, uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have done that or 
you know, I, it may have been unintended, but I, I apologize for the way that that came, maybe came across. I could have, I could rethink. And we come together and we embrace one another and we forgive one another, which is the way we're to live in reconciliation, which is a message our world desperately needs today, is a message of reconciliation today. That reconciliation as we live and as we, uh, we, we live that out, it helps relieve stress. When we focus on God in difficult times, it helps relieve stress. You know, that's why the writer Paul in the New Testament says, you know, when, you, uh, when you're feeling anxious, pray. You know, give thanks. Uh, because as we remember the good things in our life, it helps uh, take away that, that feeling that, that, that may be rising up in us. Uh, of negativity in our lives and so being positive and being thankful helps to to change our mind to tell ourselves the truth about what is actually true and what is right in our lives very important then in verses 9 and 10 God here is indicating that we are to uh, to to honor him Honor him with our resources in times of prosperity. Let's look at this. Verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor the Lord with your wealth. And with the first, first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. Honor here is very important. See, he's talking about times of prosperity. When, when God is blessing us, and we're told in the New Testament that every good and perfect gift comes from God, in James chapter 1, verse 17, that every good and perfect gift comes from God. So when God allows us a blessing of having wealth, some riches, we are to honor God with our wealth. God doesn't give it to us to live selfishly. To say, you know, I'm going to use this to buy more and more stuff, to, to try to keep up with everybody else and have all the newest things and the biggest houses and the nicest cars. And, and all those kind of things, well, you know, they're there. But God wants us to have a kingdom view with our wealth. He wants us to focus on him and honor him with those things and the times that God has blessed us in prosperity to honor him with our wealth. And he says, then your barns will be filled with prosperity and your vats bur will be bursting with wine. See, there's a principle here in the scriptures that in general, as we bless others, oftentimes blessing does come back. Now, I'm not putting numbers. I'm not doing anything like that. But oftentimes there's a blessing that, that comes back. We shouldn't expect it. But here the scriptures indicate that as we honor God with the wealth that we've been given, when we do things for others, there is a blessing that comes back. Then it goes on in verses 11 and 12 that we are to welcome God's discipline and suffering that comes from it. We're to welcome God's discipline and the suffering that comes from it. Let's read this. He says, the writer of Proverbs here says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Wow. Maybe that's a new concept for you. That God actually disciplines us. It may be a hard concept for some of us to think. What? God God disciplines? I thought God was all loving. And and God was, you know, just, just a really nice... He just wants the best for us. Well, he does want the best for us. But it says this. Let's read it. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him he loves. As a father in whom his son delights. So when we're going through troubles. When we're going through difficulties. Oftentimes God uses these. He sometimes disciplines us. And, and we can see this throughout the Old Testament. Even into the New Testament. That sometimes God disciplines us. For our own good, our own benefit, or for the benefit of others. And we may not like it. We may not understand it completely. We may not even understand all of God's reasons why there is suffering. 
or why we may go through times of difficulty and discipline. But the fact is we are to learn to think about discipline and suffering and pain in our lives in a different way because God may be um, using this in our lives to help us to grow. So here the, the, the writer says that we are to welcome God's discipline. So the, the idea of not despising the Lord's wisdom is this idea of, you know, not do not become bitter. Do not become bitter and, and because bitterness will eat you up. You know, when you're going through suffering, when you're going through difficulty, it's very easy for us to, to get bitter and get upset and be like, well, that's not fair, God. How come so-and-so's got this and I don't? How come they've got a better job and I don't? God, how come they've got a nicer house and I don't? How come they've got a, you know, nicer uh, family or even have a family and I don't? And oftentimes we can look at what others have and think that, you know, that it's not fair. It's not fair. But God wants us to see individually that sometimes there's a reason why he has allowed us to be in the place that we are. It could be that he is trying to teach us. He's trying to mold us. And that's the idea of discipline. It's not like trying to beat us over the head, but it's it's the idea of uh, correcting our ways, of teaching us a lesson. And the idea here, even in verse 12, is as a father, uh, the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. You know, I love my kids. I love my kids. I desperately love my kids. And if you have kids, you probably desperately love them too. And you don't want them to get hurt. You don't want them to get sick. And so there are things we do sometimes to uh, correct their behavior, you know, when they're throwing a ten temper tantrum and they're um, uh, throwing things at their siblings or they're trying to hurt, we, we stop that. We have to discipline. We might put them for a time out or we may do something else uh, to to say, you know, this attitude, this this way of treating other people is incorrect. And and so as a, as a father, as a mother, as a parent, as we discipline our children, uh, it's it's for their good. And we don't do it out of hatred. We do it out of love. I, at least I hope we do, right? We should be doing it out of love. Because it's a correction. It's trying to correct them. Uh, to teach them life skills. To teach them how to work with others. To how to live. So that they can contribute to our world in a positive way. To our society in a positive way. And they learn respect. And they learn love. And they learn care. And they learn to, to work hard. Because we... we teach them we train them so that's the idea of discipline is training of of discipline molding them and taking them in that that pathway and and be wary of his reproof so don't let bitterness get up in, inside us because of our situation but recognize that god has allowed for this and that's okay because there's a purpose in that and we are to be faithful in that purpose and i know some of you are really suffering right now through some very difficult things Remember God knows. Remember he cares. And remember that there may be a reason. It reminds me, you know, of the, one of our dear sisters at our church, she she loves God and she loves to share Jesus with others. And she's going through cancer treatment the last number of years. And every opportunity she gets, she would share Jesus with the nursing staff, with the doctors, with the people around her. And and I just thought, that's the that's really... The, the simple way that we are to live is looking at these op, these things that happen. They're, they're life changes. They're hurtful things. They're, you know, they're hard things. But we look at these things as opportunities that God may be placing us in for his will, for his purpose. You may be in a job you don't like right now. You may be in a situation where you're going through cancer treatment or in a neighborhood you don't particularly like right at the moment or with a, a family or, or or situations but you know what sometimes God allows for these things because there's something he wants for you to teach you and he wants also maybe to teach somebody else or maybe they he's put you there for that person to hear and see the gospel being lived out have you ever thought about that the writer of Hebrews says this think of what he went through how he put up with so much hatred from sinners. So do not let yourselves become discouraged and give up. For in your struggle against sin, 
you have not yet had to resist to the point of being killed. Have you forgotten the encouraging words which God speaks to you as his sons and daughters? My child, and this is a reference back to Proverbs, pay attention when the Lord corrects you. And do not be discouraged when he rebukes you, because the Lord corrects everyone he loves and punishes everyone he accepts as a child. Endure what, you're suffer, endure what you suffer as being a father's punishment. Your suffering shows that God is treating you as ch his children. Was there ever a child who was not punished by his father? If you are not punished, as all his children are, it means that you are not, uh, not real children, but bastards. In this case, uh, the case of the human fathers, they punished us and we respected them. How much more, then, should we submit to our spiritual father and live? Our human fathers punish us for a short time, as it seemed right to them, but God does it for our own good, so that we may share his holiness. We, when we are punished, it seems to us, as at the time, at the time something to make us sad, not glad. Later, however, those who have been disciplined by such punishment reap the peaceful reward of righteous life. This writer indicates to us that um, Jesus, Jesus shows us trust. Jesus shows us honor before the Father. He trusted God that he honored the Father, and even through difficult things, he honored him. And, and the writer of Hebrews wants to know that we're not to give up when we're going through difficulties. He's writing to the, to the, the Jewish uh, believers who are being persecuted for their faith, who are suffering for Jesus. And he says this, uh, remember Proverbs? Remember the writer of Proverbs said this, that you are his children and, he, and, and God disciplines his children. And, and so he says, don't, don't give up, don't be discouraged. And he says to endure what suffering that we suffer as part of God's punishment because it shows that we are his children. Jesus shows us that he welcomes that, that and honored God and, and he's in our, our example. He's our example. I mean, how, do, how does this all work out? We see it in Jesus' life. We also see it in the disciples' life. When you go to uh, uh, the story of Acts chapter 5, we see the, the, the story of, of the disciples who had been arrested by uh, the Jewish officials for preaching the gospel in Jerusalem in the area, and they're arrested, and, and they're, they're imprisoned. And when they're let go, they're they're, they're, they're so excited that they had the opportunity to suffer for Christ. They had the opportunity to suffer for him, and very different sometimes in our view of suffering. Sometimes we go through it where we mope and we complain and we whine, and we don't realize that maybe this is God's way of doing something through our life, and instead of rejoicing and saying, you know what, I have a part, when I suffer, I'm suffering for God you know, through these difficult times. But let me stay uh, trusting God, staying steadfast in his ways and in his wills, will and, and, and fearing him and honoring him. And that's what the disciples did. They feared God. They trusted him. They, they did what's right. They preached the gospel. They went out and they started following what God had planned. And God honored them. And the, and the world was changed because these men were willing and women were willing to serve and to be punished and suffer. And it was all for God's glory. It was all for his kingdom. And, and, and we see it worked out. And they rejoiced in that. It says in that passage in Acts 5. That they rejoiced for the opportunity to suffer for Christ. Are you acting wisely before God today? Are you trusting and relying on Jesus? Do you, do you love God with all your heart? with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? Do you love him? Are you walking in his ways? Are you, are you picking up your Bible and saying, I'm going to live by this book, how God's taught me to live? Or am I picking up other little self-help books? Am I picking up little articles from the internet that make me feel good? Or, or, or some of them can be helpful, but sometimes we, we go to these things and we think, well, that, that fits, you know, I, 
you know, living God's way, that's that's a bit hard, this thing over here. And I know what God wants me to do, but you know what? This this seems like kind of a way around. And we find out later that it's, it's difficult. Are we following in God's ways? Are we following in God's will? Are we choosing to live the way that the scriptures teach us to live? Are we honoring God with our resources? Are you honoring God with your resources? The money and the wealth and the things that God has given you, your time, your abilities, are you honoring God with those things? Or are you living for yourself? Are you living for this kingdom? Are you allowing bitterness during suffering to creep up within you and tear you apart, make you an angry person, make you a difficult person to be around? Are you welcoming God's discipline and suffering in your life? Or are you trying to avoid it? Are you living a life acting wisely before God? But deep down, I think as Christians, true believers, we, we desperately want to live a life that is wise before God. So what if we did not fear people? What if we didn't fear people of what they could say or do to us? But we had a proper fear of God. We trusted God. We fear Him and fear Him alone. We, we put our belief and trust in Him. That's what we're called to do. If you've not put your fear, faith and uh, in trust in Jesus Christ, and trust Him to save you from your sin, to set you free from the power of sin and death over your life today, then you're, you're, you're on a path towards destruction. And so we're called by, by the, the, the proverb writer here to follow and trust God. Put your faith in Him. He will never let you down. He has got this whole thing, this whole world, this whole universe, the whole plan in process. Nothing shocks Him. We can trust Him. What is keeping you from trusting and having a proper fear of God in your life? Do you fear that He can send you, He can give you eternal life? And, uh, and He has control over that? And He has control to send you to eternal death and hell? I do. He has that power. He has that authority over us. But the Bible promises this, that if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that he will forgive us of our sin, the sin that leads us down that path towards eternal life in hell. That we deserve death, we deserve that punishment, we deserve to die, we deserve eternal life in hell because we've offended God by how we live. Because the sin in our life, every inkling of sin in our life is an offense to God. It's like taking a glass of water and putting oil in it. And it, I wouldn't want to drink it anymore because it's got oil in there. It's, it's a tainted. And God cannot have sin uh, contained in, in heaven. It just mix him up. He can't, it doesn't have sin in his life. He's perfect, always perfect. All his decisions are right. But you and I are not. And so we need to be made whole. We need to be made perfect. We need our sins forgiven. We need those offenses cleared up. And God promises that through Jesus Christ, that if we trust in him, we trust in God's provision of Jesus, that he died on the cross, and three days later he rose again to set us free from sin. He took our sin on himself. He set us free by raising himself from the dead. And now he is seated at the right hand of God. And he did that for you and I. That's the good news, that Jesus Christ died in your place and mine. And that if we believe and we trust in him, we will be saved. It's not by what we do that saves us. It's because of what God has already done through Jesus. But now, as Christians, we live in this life in honor of God, to live in holiness and for, for him and for his glory. And so we live out this kind of life in trust in obedience and having a proper fear of God. What if our, we also prayed for boldness in our witness, that we weren't fearful of what other people can do to us? We only fear God. We know he has everything under control. So I don't fear what people are going to do. And some of you say, well, I, you know, I, I try to live my life for, for Jesus and hope that people will see it and, and be drawn to Jesus. Yes, we need to do that. But the Bible is very clear that Part of our witness is also verbal. When was the last time you shared your faith? When was the last time you told someone that Jesus is the only one? How, see, Romans chapter 
uh, 7 verse 14 tells us that, that how will they hear without someone telling them, without somebody bringing the good news? We have to speak. We have to act. We have to live for Christ, but we have to speak too. And so even Paul, Paul struggled with this in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 6, he asks and uh, asks the Ephesians, he says this, uh, listen to what he says, do all this in prayer, asking for the fa of God's help, pray on every occasion as the Spirit leads, for this reason keep alert and never give up, pray always for all God's people and pray also for me that God will give me a message when I am I am ready to speak, so I may speak boldly and make known the gospel secret. For the sake of the gospel, I am an ambassador, though I am in, now in prison. Pray that I may be bold, be bold in speaking about the gospel as I should. See, even Paul prayed to the Ephesian church. He's close to the end of his life here, and he's a praying Asking them, asking them to pray for him for boldness. This is the Apostle Paul. This is when we, we read and we think, man, this guy is, is a missionary extraordinaire. But yet he still struggled in proclaiming and being bold in sharing the gospel. And if the Apostle Paul needed to do that, how much more do you and I need to pray and ask God to help us to boldly speak the truth, to share God's message with others? When was the last time you prayed that prayer? What a, what a difference in our world can make if we were more bold in our, our sharing of our faith. If you don't feel like sharing your faith, you have to ask yourself a question. Do you really believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe in the gospel? Do you, do you trust in him? And if this is good news, why wouldn't we want to share it? Because good news needs to be shared, doesn't it? If I'm cancer free, I want to tell somebody. If I if I get to, you know, my, my, my son when he had his surgery and he came through and pulled through, I, I was excited. It was good news. I wanted to share. We should want to share good news. Why would you not want to share the good news of Jesus Christ? And it's telling of our heart and where it really is if we don't. So I implore you, I encourage you to encourage you from Scripture to share God's word, to be bold in your proclamation. Of the gospel. Then he goes on. We, we have to remember too. That uh, we are to share our resources. Share the resources that God has given to us. Our talents. Our time. Our effort. Our money. All those things that God has given. How much are you using for God's kingdom? Are, are, you, are you giving? Are you involved in sharing your resources and time with others? For God's kingdom? For God's glory. Investing in God's kingdom comes with great kingdom interest. You know, we may not, you know, by giving to the church, yeah, you may not gain earthly interest in the sense that um, it may get you money back. But there is an eternal interest at work that glorifies God. And that there are rewards for us in eternity for following and doing Serving Christ and serving Him faithfully, uh, there is reward. It's eternal and it's not a short-lived interest. It comes with great reward. What if we didn't get angry over the situations we face in life? What if we didn't get angry and bitter and upset with our the difficulties? What if when we have a job we don't like or we're in a house we don't like or in a a, um, you know, relationship that's that's fallen apart. Why do we get so angry and bitter and upset? Well, what if we didn't get angry? What if we looked at this as an opportunity to grow in our lives? To trust God more as a learning opportunity. You know, this is one of the things I've learned over the last number of years. You know, many years ago I went through a very difficult situation in my own life. But through that difficult, I was able to seek some wise counsel through a, a Christian and who, who helped me work through some issues. Very difficult at the time, but it also helped me grow. And I'm not perfect. I've got a long way to go and a lot, a lot still to learn, but it helped me to grow. It was a hurtful time. It was a very difficult time, but it helped me to grow in who I am and how I respond to others. So, so suffering and, and these difficulties, they help us. 
if we're willing to change our mindset, if we're willing to change how we think about these things. So I encourage you to think about that. What can I learn from this difficult situation I'm facing in my life? What would happen if I chose to learn instead of try to push away from the challenges in my life and look at it as an opportunity for God to work in me and I trust in him, trust in God despite the difficulty like the apostles did. So a few things we can do. First of all, we can pray. Pray and ask God for his wisdom, help, uh, helping us to act wisely, help us to trust in him, help us to acknowledge him in all our ways, help us not to trust in our own understanding and to follow him, to try not to be wise in our own eyes, but to be wise in God's eyes. Let's pray that kind of prayer. Let's pray asking God for wisdom and help us to honor him and to, to honor him with the things that we've been given. Ask God, God, with what I have, time, resources, money, whatever I have, God, what can I use for you today? What have you given to me that you want me to bless others with? Let's pray that kind of prayer and pray that even when we face difficulties and suffering, that God would help us through and see uh, see ways in which we can learn from it and grow in it and that he can be glorified in it through us. We need to give thanks to God for the many blessings he does give. When we do follow their, follow him, the, the writer here tells us there are many blessings. You know, he makes our path straight. He will fill our storehouses full. He will, you know, um, he, he delights in us. Even though sometimes we go through the difficulties, God delights in us as his children and these are blessings and we can thank God for those things so we can give thanks and if you want to study some more on this this week this idea of suffering and difficulty and God's working in his plans uh, look at the book of Job study and read the book of Job this week look around this week see what's going on kind of let's open our eyes to see um, those around us and look for legitimate needs and pray and ask God how we can meet those needs and so maybe that's uh, financially helping somebody, maybe that's giving a resource, maybe it's actually spending some time helping somebody this week, or listening and sitting down, having a, a conversation with them, maybe uh, virtually having a conversation with them, but to be an encouragement, to be a help. But how can we creatively, how can we live this out this week? And lastly, if you like to memorize and you haven't already, I encourage you to memorize Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Let's just pray. Father in heaven, thank you this morning for the opportunity to, to look into this passage, to learn how to grow and to walk in your godly wisdom again, and, and what that means, what the expectations are for us. Help us to live for you this week, and train us, guide us, mold us, shape us, so that we can glorify you. And God, I know there's so many of us maybe going through difficulties this week and the sufferings. Help us to see those as opportunities to uh, learn more about you, learn more about ourselves, and uh, that God, you would use these opportunities in our lives to also glorify you in some way. And so God, just be with us this week. Bless us, walk with us, uh, use us and thank you for the many blessings that come from knowing you and serving you but most importantly God I just pray that we would honor you with our time our resources but also honor you by acknowledging you and and trusting in you by spending time with you God you desire to have that relationship with us that we spend time in your word that we spend time in prayer God help us this week to do this and to to just spend time to grow and trust in you. So God, bless us this week as we seek to live for you. And uh, we thank you again for your goodness and grace and uh, for the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Here I am, humbled by your majesty, covered by your grace so free. Here I am, knowing I'm a sinful man, covered by 
the blood of the Lamb. Now I found the greatest love is mine since you laid down your Your grace has found me just as I am Empty handed but alive in your hands Here I am Humbled by the love that you give Forgiven so that Just